Welcome to Pioneer Congregational Church, Sacramento, California. This is our online worship for July 5th, 2020. So we celebrate July 4th weekend. We wanna talk about our country, our community, and being followers of the way of Christ. Glad you could join us. Join me in the call to worship. Dust we are, and to dust we shall return, all of us. Giver of life, help us to see our common humanity. Help us to care for all that our common earth produces. Help us to appreciate all in this land we call home. In all our diversity, we come to celebrate our unity as your beloved community. Amen. In our first lesson today, this description of those who are in heaven goes out of its way to be inclusive. If we want to build God's realm on earth, shouldn't we be as inclusive? From Revelations chapter 7, verses 9 to 12. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God singing, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen.
our second lesson today, when Matthew gives the genealogy of Jesus, he lists only four women. They all have one thing in common. They were not Hebrews. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Would you join your hearts with mine in prayer? God of grace, help us to understand how we as human beings are one and how we can be united also in you and through you. Amen. One of the things that always amazes me is when people want to hold up the Bible and say, it's the very word of God inerrant and infallible. And then I wonder if they've ever read it because often those same people are the ones that are marginalizing other people, acting as if only their kind of people are going to be in heaven. So I wonder if they've read even the New Testament as followers of the way of Jesus. You would think they have because the very first chapter and the last book make it very clear to us that the way of Jesus is inclusive. The realm of God is inclusive, meant for everybody. In the book of Revelation, you might be surprised. When you look at the description of the people around the throne, the writer goes out of his way to make sure that every division that human beings have created for separating people from one another is taken out of the picture. Every nation, every language, every tribe, all of those things are gone. All of them are together around the throne. All of them are equal around the throne. That's the picture we have of heaven. So we need to look at the lines that we have made and use them to separate other people. Sometimes we simply draw lines on a map and we use that to say this side versus that side. They're totally different people. And so we have the famous line that resulted in Brazil speaking Portuguese and the rest of South America speaking Spanish because a pope in Italy drew a line on a map. Or we have the Council of Berlin where the colonial powers of Europe took the map of Africa and Southern Asia and drew lines and divided up the world to say which nation in Europe would be able to colonize which land in the other parts of the world, regardless of who is already there. So we've done it by simply drawing lines on a map and saying, this is the way it's supposed to be. And then we start acting as if all that's God ordained because we grew up with that and we were taught it in our books that this is the way it is. And if we don't stop to question, is that the way it was meant to be? Or why is it the way it is? We start to put other people in different categories and then act as if we're the chosen ones. We're not just elect, we're elite. We're the, the ones who will be around the throne. But our word of God doesn't allow that. Our word of God should erase that kind of thinking in our mind. 
but we still have this idea of purity. This country belongs to this race of people. The prosperity, the privilege of ruling, that belongs to this race of people. And everybody else should be subservient, subservient to them. Understand your place. Don't get uppity. But look at Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus. You would think if anybody would have a pure genealogy, it would be Jesus. Paul even brags about his genealogy. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. He has his ancestry down. He knows who he is. He has every right to claim his Jewish heritage. But when you look at Jesus and we look at the line of Judah, Judah's line would not continue if it wasn't for Tamar dressing up like a prostitute to seduce her father-in-law who was not doing his duty by her. Judah's sons had died. Judah was supposed to provide for Tamar, but he didn't. So Tamar ended up providing a son, two sons, for Judah, but not giving any credit to Judah. He thought he was going in with a prostitute. So her courage, she could have been stoned to death for it, allowed the line of Judah to continue. And from Judah, we get the name Jewish, Jews. So we owe a lot to this pagan woman who knew what she needed to do. We, know we owe a lot to people like Ruth, a Moabitess, from the land of Moab. And the Moab people were considered to be almost mongrels of that day. They were descendants of the daughters of Lot, who had to get their own father drunk in order to become pregnant so they could carry on and create a nation from the line of Lot. So the Moab people were considered mongrels, outcasts. But here, Ruth allied herself with Naomi, even though they were both widows, and returned at great risk to the land of Judea to be with Naomi, and from her, the line continues. And we can't neglect Rahab, the harlot, the prostitute in Jericho, who sided with the spies that Joshua had sent into the city and helped the people of Israel to conquer the city of Jericho and then to occupy the land of Canaan. So it became the promised land. These were the kind of people, the women especially, that are in the lineage of Jesus. And the last one mentioned doesn't even get a name. We know her as the wife of Uriah. Uriah was a Hittite, probably from what we would call central Turkey today. And she came because the king coerced her to come. And then she took David to task. After their child died, the first child died, she made him promise that the next child, Solomon, would become the king. Solomon was well down the line. He had many older brothers. But for Solomon, because of the wife of Uriah, David was a father. David trained Solomon then to become the wise king that he was. But it was because of the action of the wife of Uriah, we call Bathsheba. So we have to understand the lineage of Jesus is not what we would call pure. And I wonder what the daughters of the Confederacy would do for that. The daughters of the American Revolution that like to trace their heritage all the way back to the time of the American Revolution or trace their heritage back to that little unpleasantness between the states. We call it the Civil War. But it's the action of those kinds of people that want to act like and rewrite history so that their lineage is pure. 
It's their descendants who deserve to be the rulers of the land, who deserve to prosper even at the expense of other people. I wonder, have they read this thing they call the Word of God? They want to look at God and claim that God is the one who has blessed them, that has given them this privilege? But God would say, no, look, I am including everybody, and I want to make sure you understand that no one is pure. I grew up in an atmosphere of purity. Purity was very important. We had to have pure doctrine. We had to have purity of practice. And it got to the point where I finally told my father, you know, it's going to get to the point where it's going to be just you and me because everybody else we've disagreed with, so they're not pure. And when it gets down to you and me, it's going to be, you know, I'm not too sure about you. When we start kicking people out because there's a disagreement and every disagreement gets to be a cause for saying, you're not pure, I am, then we're going to be left all alone. But we're called to come together. We're called to be a nation. We're called to be one people on one land. And when we talk about the land, we talk about it as a her, because it's the Mother Earth. That's the thinking that is behind that particular pronoun set that we use for our country, because it's actually the land that makes the country. And all the people in it then have to live together. And it doesn't matter where they came from. It doesn't matter the color of their skin. It doesn't matter the faith tradition that they have. They're living on the same land. That makes them a nation. And that nation needs to act in unity. That nation needs to act as one body. We express that in the church, that we are one body of Christ with many different members, and each member has a different function. And then we leave the church and we go out into our communities, into our nation, and act like, well, you're not one of us. You're different, so you don't count. Have we left our faith at the church door? Have we not taken it with us out into the world and realize that the whole world is a unit, should have a unity? We talk about one God creating us all. Let, let us act like that. And let us then build a country. And we know we have to build on the past because we can't erase all the past. But we can look at that past honestly and we can see where we have made mistakes and we can see where we have left some people suffering needlessly. And we can change. We can find new ways of acting with one another, new ways of building our institutions so that there is greater equity. As we celebrate Independence Day, we talk about our nation. And we should be celebrating not just the fact that we are independent, but that we have come together. We have come together to be one nation. It wasn't until the 1950s that the Pledge of Allegiance was adopted. And so those of us who grew up as school children in the 1950s remember one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. It wasn't there originally. It's a pretty recent addition, actually. And if that's the way we're going to express it, maybe that's the way we ought to live it. One nation under God, with liberty and justice for all. Amen.
today as we pray together in community. We remember all those who are sick. We know some are in intensive care, some are in hospice care. We know that many more people are concerned about their health, an underlying condition that makes them more vulnerable than general population to the COVID disease. So we look at all of these people and we remember also the ones who are putting their lives at risk in our hospitals to care for the sick, but also in our grocery stores, in our farms, gathering the crops, driving the trucks, exposing their health to other people so that we can have what we need to live comfortably. We remember all of these people and we pray for them in our prayers as well. We remember our nation today, the polarization we are experiencing. Can we come together? Can we remember our common humanity, our common citizenship? Can we remember to treat others as we would like to be treated, to love our neighbor as ourself? So would you join your hearts with mine in prayer? God of grace, we ask simply that you would be with us as we journey through this life. We journey with people who are struggling with their health. We know these bodies will not last forever, and that concerns us. So as we want to be with people in their great time of need, in illnesses, and even in dying, we ask that you would help us and help them. Grant each of us always the reassurance that your spirit never leaves us, that there is going to be a source of peace and a source of strength for us. We ask that you would bless those who have dedicated their lives to helping others in the medical profession. Bless their work and let it be effective. We also ask that you would care for those people in service industries, so many times overlooked, but without their care, without them risking exposure to the public, we would not be able to live. And so we ask that you would bless them as well. Keep us in our homes, in our relationships, in our churches, keep us united in love. Keep us always with a goal ahead of us that looks for your reign here on earth, a reign that will prom promote greater justice and a more equitable peace. We ask that you would be with those who serve in our armed forces as they put their selves on the line to preserve the peace. All these things we sum up in the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the first Sunday of the month. It is our custom to celebrate Holy Communion on the first Sunday of a month. And so at this time, I would encourage you if you would like to join us at home to, in doing this, that you would have your bread ready, have your drink ready, so that we can commune together, separated perhaps by many miles, but joined in one spirit. We use the order of communion found in the bulletin. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger. You who believe shall never thirst. 
in company with all who hunger for spiritual food, we come to this table sharing the life-giving bread. God be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Jesus sat with all sorts, the many different colors of humanity, but mainly those excluded and broke bread. So along with everyone on whom the world has turned its back, along with everyone hungry for justice and truth, along with everyone abused as stranger and foreigner, along with everyone who does not fit normal, along with everyone who questions, doubts, and even denies, along with every prejudice that has ever been flung, along with everyone made poor by others' riches, you and I are welcome at this table. We give thanks for this table, which gives us spiritual nourishment for this path of life among the shadows of the world, finding the moments of hope in the rising of the cross. May our hands cup the grain, our lives bear the faith, our souls grip the truth, and our hearts trust the promise. May God's steadfast love be our traveling companion. Amen. When Jesus knew his time on earth was short, he gathered with his disciples, those whom he loved. And as the host of the meal, he stood up at the beginning of the meal, took bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he divided it up and said, take and eat, all of you. This is my body given for you. Do this remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is my life's blood poured out for you. Drink of it and do this remembering me. And so we pray. Gracious God, through this sacrament, we celebrate the unity that we have with you, understanding how we are one with you, one with the one we follow, the way of Christ Jesus. Then we are also one with one another. And in this blessed community, we ask that you would be a real presence in our lives, that we would know we are forgiven that we would know that we all walk in your grace and that we therefore act together as one body. For Christ's sake, amen. And so we take the bread and we take and eat the bread of life. take the cup, take and drink the cup of salvation. And would you join with me in the prayer? Eternal God, you have called your people from east to west and north to south to feast at this table of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the spiritual food we have received. By the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us faithful to your will. Go with us to the streets, to our homes, and to our places of labor and leisure, so that whether we are gathered or scattered, we may be the servant church of the servant Christ. 
in whose name we rejoice to pray. Amen. In our announcements today, we'd like to remind you of the ministry that we have going on through the internet, through email, and so forth. So midweek, look for a midweek meditation from me. And in that email, after you read the meditation, look for a link for Experience Peace. You can also see that on our website, pioneerucc.org. So Experience Peace is a meditation experience all on its own. Jim provides music that helps us find our peace. And then there are words for meditation that you will hear from me and from Donna Apodoni, who has been our guest narrator for several years on our Christmas Songs of the Season programs. She also happens to be on Capital Public Radio. So we have meditation words, but especially the mu beautiful music and the pictures that our music director, Jim Jordan, produces, all designed to help us find peace in a moment when we have so many reasons for anxiety. So please look for that. I would also encourage you, as we talk about being a body of Christ, that at this time, use these means that we have to communicate. Even as we open up, we know there are still many people who cannot get out as well as they could, that we may not be able to see face to face. But we can call them. We can communicate to them. So especially those of you who are members of Pioneer, I would encourage you to take five or six people from the congregation on your list. Make it a point to get in touch with them during the week. Keep that community feel going. We have been blessed with the te technology to do it. It would be a shame if we didn't use it. We also need to understand that the needs of the church financially have been cut back as much as they can be. We've cut back on things like the utilities and other sources that we had to have before we don't need now. So we've pared down our budget as much as we can, but we still have some things that must be paid for the staff and for the facility. So I would encourage you to please remember the church financially. There are ways to do that. You can see that on our website through PayPal or Givelify, or you can send a check into the church office. All the mail is checked at least twice every week and any checks are deposited on a timely basis. So please remember the church in your giving. We are then also going to be having a special congregational meeting via Zoom. You will be getting a letter from Vi McNally, who is our congregational or church council president, and calling for the meeting for Sunday July 19th. We have our usual 11.30 Zoom fellowship time, and then we have at 12 o'clock the official meeting of the congregation, where members of the congregation are asked to tune in and give their vote. But because of these extraordinary circumstances, we're also sending out the information in the letter that you should be getting in the next day or two. Read through that look at the links that are provided there, study the situation for yourself, and vote via email uh, if you're not gonna be able to be at the Zoom meeting and register your vote that way. You will, will be accepting votes through the mail or through the email, whichever way you can do it. So it is to consider hanging a Black Lives banner on our church. It is our policy, no one person can speak for the church, but if the church agrees that something should be done, then, then it can be done. So we know we have diversity of opinion, we always do, but we listen to one another and we act in unity. 
So please keep that congregational meeting on your calendar and please read your mail. Thank you.
Now, before we go, we always ask God's blessing. And may the God that we know is love continue to be with us. May the Christ who has shown us that we all live in God's grace be with us. And may the Holy Spirit continue to be in each and every heart, teaching us the way. Amen.